Just worship this morning. just worship him this morning.
Can you feel it? Can you feel the lift coming? See, there's something in this presence. When you begin to worship God, there's something in the presence of the Lord that means that whatever you came in with doesn't have to be what you go out with. Okay? And so the only reason an MC would get up halfway during one of the worship songs because of the Lord. So this this is what I feel led to, to read out. So this is it. It's chapter 5 of Romans. Just a little bit of it. I'm not reading the whole lot. And it says, finding peace and joy. So I'm guessing that there's someone here that needs some peace and joy in their lives. And it says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, isn't it good to have faith, hey? We have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. If you want peace today, you can have it. You make Christ alone your cornerstone. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. How good is it to share God's glory? I want some of that. We can rejoice too. We can rejoice too. We can rejoice too. When we run into problems and trials, for we know that they are good for us. They help us learn to endure. And endurance develops strength of character in us, and character strengthens our confident expectation of salvation. If you're here wondering about your salvation today, you can have confidence expectance of salvation that's faith in action and this expectation will not disappoint us if you've come here expect that you will find what you're looking for i believe it. i have faith in that for we know how dearly god loves us because he has given us the holy spirit to fill our hearts with his love holy spirit we invite you here today we invite you to fill our hearts with your love. Love for others, love for Christ, our cornerstone. So we're going to come into a time of worship now. If you, if you want, if you need that, if you need that peace, if you need that joy, if you need that confident expectation of salvation, here's your first moment, here's your first chance. Step into everything that he has for you this morning. Don't hold back. Oh, man. 
Christ, we thank you, Jesus Christ, we thank you so much that you are our cornerstone, that it's in you we live and move and have our being, that we don't have to compare ourselves to others, but we just measure ourselves by you, and you find us righteous, you give us righteousness, you give us joy, you give us peace, you give us every good thing. I thank you, Jesus, that in you, because of you, we can have confident expectation of salvation that faith will begin to rise in our hearts, that we'll step out in ways that we've never stepped out before, that, we, that we'll talk differently, that we, will, that we will hold ourselves differently, that we would speak differently, that, that the words that would come out of us would, would resonate within people. <laughs> Amen. Hey, Shannon, if it's cool, if you can, you pass me, yes, that'd be cool. Hey guys, how's it going? But before you sit down, say hi to someone around you. Um, now say hi to someone that you don't know, because if you're like me, I'll always say hi to that. I know you. Hey, how's it going? We really like you. All right. If it's your first time here with us at Invercargill Christian Centre, g'day, welcome, talofa, ni hao, bulavanaka, um, kia ora, <laughs> that's, that's all I got, that's all I got, alright, that's uh, pretty cool. Hey, um, so we've got some pretty awesome stuff coming, we've got some pretty awesome stuff coming up. My name's Ray, I'm the youth pastor here. So hi, g'day, if you haven't met anyone else, you've met me now, so come say hi afterwards, all right? But we've got such a great day planned for you guys today, like it's, it's going to be awesome, it's going to be so cool, we've got um, some great celebration stuff going on, um, Tabitha Luke is preaching this morning, which is going to be amazing, I am so excited by that, I'm excited and a little scared, I go away with revelation and stuff that I don't understand and... It's quite funny because, you know, you ask for meat all the time and then when you get given it, it's like, oh no, milk thing. Um, and cookies, and cookies. Chuck's chewy cookies. Um, just saying, speaking out in the face. No, um. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, Chuck gets up and goes, oh man, I really feel led to, no. Um. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about manipulation another day. Um. No, hey, we've got such a great time. Now, here at Christian Centre, um, we celebrate when things are going awesome. So we've got um, some celebration stuff going. But before we do that, Kiyama, can I get you to come up? You're not going to, you don't have to speak. I just need you to throw things at people. Yeah. So we celebrate. So we've got celebration. So if you've had a birthday this week, if you've had an anniversary, um, Kiyama, amazing man that he is, is going to give you a chocolate and a hug. Now, I don't know what that looks like. Uh, if Kiriyama has to run from place to place, he's going to get progressively sweat sweatier. So my suggestion is own up at the start because you don't want to be the guy on the end. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. So if, um, so if you've had a birthday this week, give us a wave. Give us a wave. Someone's going to be first. Brian Nicholson. Give Brian a big hand. Happy birthday, Brian. Awesome, buddy. All right. Anniversaries, it's okay. I, I didn't say kiss Cheryl. Or was it your birthday? You're holding up something that I'm not sure what it is. Is it a picture of kittens? What's that? It's a card with singing cats in it. Woohoo! Okay, happy singing cats birthday. All right. It's amazing. That's cool. I've never had a card with singing cats in it before even get those my cards growing up when they had sounds normally had fart noises or car noises or oh thanks guys that's uh, i feel really honored and blessed but no. um anniversaries oh hi lisa it's happy unbirthday unbelievable happy man had his birthday that's because cool. so this is due date today so he would have been born today that's so cool he's here to celebrate his zero birthday that's amazing I think he could be Korean. 
No, because because oh no, that sounded really bad. No, because Korean because Korean cause Korean kids they start at one. Like they they come out. They count the first year of pregnancy as the first year of life. They come out at one. So their birthday is their first birthday. Oh, I'm not being racist. I was being culturally sensitive, but you guys made it wrong. You guys made it wrong. All right, Judy. Anniversary. Happy anniversary. It's awesome. Did Phil get you flowers and stuff? Did you get Phil flowers and stuff? <laughs> Happy anniversary. Okay. <laughs> Moving on quickly. No, that's awesome. That's so. How long have you been married for, Judy? Twenty-eight years. I love it when people have been married almost longer than I've been alive because I feel young again. So good. So good. All right. Is there anyone else who would just like chocolate or a hug? Cho oh, anniversary, Lance. Is it your anniversary? Oh, that's so cool. One year, one year that you've had a line in, and that's, a, that's answer to a whole heap of prayer. You've got to understand that's an absolute miracle. So they've had their baby girl now for an entire year. That's so cool. Congratulations, guys. That's amazing. Anyone else? Who else would like either chocolate slash a hug? Who have we got? Oh, Roz. We got a... That's like... Oh, here we go. Kitty Yum is pretty popular with the older ladies. <laughs> I... I don't know where to go from there. It's... Apparently up is the only way to go from that, a comment like that. Okay, no, that's all right. There is a reason that they don't let me MC on a Sunday morning. All right. Yes. Yes. Peter wants a... uh, Peter hasn't had breakfast, but it's always a real bad sign when one of the lead singers passes out on stage. He's got, oh, it's the spirit. No, he's bleeding. That's bad. Kitty, have you got any more chocolates? Oh, oh, hey, hang on, wait, no, no, I can fix this, I can fix this. There you go, all right. Anything will keep you going. That's got some sugar, oh, no, they're sugar free. <laughs> At least you'll sing better. Okay, it'll be like, how, oh, I feel the anointing, that's spearmint. Official flavor of Christians everywhere. Okay. Where are we going from now? Okay. Um, what I want to do is... <laughs> Paul will help me. Um, we've got some notices coming up and we've got a celebration coming up. But um, Paul, if you wanted to come up and just say uh, what's happening with the seniors tomorrow, which is awesome, the Golden Eagles. Yeah, tomorrow uh, we're leaving here at 1.30 tomorrow. Okay. Um, sorry for the confusion, but... With my secretary being away, it, we had to try and preempt everything of what could happen and what wasn't going to happen. But tomorrow, what's happening is the ladies are going to the Church of Golds. Yes. And the guys are going to see some tractors. Let's hear it, guys. Yes. Okay. So 1.30 tomorrow, downstairs, and we'll be away. Thanks, bro. No worries. That sounds like a great time. Who finds dolls creepy? Especially those ones where they have the little lid that sort of only goes halfway down, like... Is that, um, hi to people on the internet, you might need to flag that as R18 explicit for a Sunday morning church service, it's fine. Hey, um, so we've got some prayer requests as well, we're continuing to, um, we continue to pray for some prayer requests and stuff like that, where, um, so we've got some great ones as a staff we pray, but, um, but actually it would be real cool just for a minute now, um, if we, um, we did that. We've got um, we've got some stuff coming up. Some people don't want their prayers shared. Um, some people want to wait until there's the praise report before they want to share, which is cool because then you get the whole story and the whole testimony, which is amazing. But um, we've got one of our congregation members who's um, who's getting some surgery to get some stuff off it, um, some stuff off him. Um, so like remove of some skin and melanomas and stuff like that. So I just thought as a church it would be cool if we could pray together just for a minute. Is that cool? So God, we lift up these prayer requests. God, we thank you so much that there's an expectation of faith here. I love the fact that there's the praise reports already written on the back. God, so we have confident expectation that, that if we ask you for stuff, that you won't give us a stone. 
So, Lord, we lift these up. Lord, we thank you for your healing. We thank you for your ministry. We thank you for your angels, Lord. So wherever these situations are, wherever these people are at, Lord, begin to minister to them now. Fill them with your spirit. <laughs> Bring everything back into alignment that needs to be in alignment. Separate anything away that needs to be separated. Shake everything off that's shakeable so that the unshaken will remain. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Hey, um, I've got a celebration. Is it okay if we do a celebration for a minute? Because we're going to do communion in just a sec, which will be cool. Um, we've got a celebration, and it's always good to celebrate. Well, I think so, because it's because especially when it's God. Hey. So um, so we we had a um we had an event on Friday, and um and it was sort of a um it was called the invasion, and um it was called the invasion, and so as um. As youth groups, we got as many youth groups together as we're willing to get together, which was awesome. And um, and then something significant happened. Our young people started handing out flyers in their schools. They started doing drop-offs. They um they um wandered up to random people in Mickey D's. Um, they um they chalk bombed the schools. They invited all their friends. They stepped out of ways that they hadn't before. And at the same time, we've got all the, the youth teams and the music teams and the tech teams all getting together and pulling something together, pulling the best together of what they can. And they've done a phenomenal job. We had, um, we had a crazy time on Friday night. So what I wanted to do was I'll show you the video. And I'll show you just a wee clip. It doesn't make sense because it's a youth video. So it'll be like, what, what, what? Oh, that's cool. And then I'll tell you why there's a reason to celebrate afterwards, okay? So this is just a snippet of what it, could look, what it looks like. So that was what happened. That was just a snippet of what happened. You got to understand the wee girl that's sort of sitting there. She can't stay in the service. She sat up there for 30 minutes and didn't move and didn't say anything, which was crazy. But hey, here's here's the celebration part. So um, what we were believing was we were believing for um, that our faith goal was to have 150 people out to have 20 salvation and recommit. That was our, that was our faith goal. We did everything that we could to do that. The guys left it all out there, and um, this is the cool thing. We had six youth ministries come, six separate youth ministries, including youth that have never done stuff with other people before. Um, we had 150 people out. We had over 150. 150 was the most. I don't know if you've noticed, but youth kind of move around a lot. Um, we had 13 salvations. 13 salvations. And then we had a ministry time afterwards that was um, that had like um, I don't know there was probably 30 over 30 people getting ministered to afterwards and this is, and some of the stuff was done in the weird order and stuff like that. We started a new thing called Fire Starters, which which Keith has um, been championing, which um, which is just basically a wee web video that gets released onto Facebook and the internet. We had people respond out of that. Oh, we saw the video. This is how we feel. Can you pray for us? So that's exciting, eh? It's so exciting. So let's celebrate that, hey? That's awesome. So just a, a huge thanks to everyone that was able to put that together. So um, so, so Ian and Sound and everyone else, let's give them a huge hand. All right. I'm on communion message today, so I don't know why they let me speak longer, but they do. Um, Shen, can you please pass me my... I'm not sure. And while you're doing that, can you pass me? Yes, that's it. Well done. Paul, did you say you don't normally have your secretary? I called Shannon a secretary once. She gave me a black eye. Just saying. I hope it's lifting thing up. You're looking more and more like Walter Mattel every day. Just Yes, oldies joke. Um, all right, so here's um. Oh, and my Bible love. Sorry. Oh, it's over here. If I was a superhero, I'd have a. My superhero power would be awkwardness. 
Thank you for that overwhelming response. Okay. Um, can I get, so I think it's the Mahino, Mahino from Shirley Ken, you guys are doing, um, you guys are doing communion today. If you want to just start handing out the elements, I'm not going to take a real long time. All right. No, that's not even the right thing. It's not so much, a, this isn't so much a communion message as it is a thought and a response, Okay. Now, I don't know if you know, but um, in, the, in the Bible, just before Jesus gets crucified on the cross, they have this thing called the Last Supper, which is like, um, which is basically, they're having this kind of remembrance ceremony so that Jesus can remind the apostles what it meant to be with them and so that there would be a, a memory intact. So that as they came around communion, as they came around the Last Supper, they would, um, they would be able to remember all that Jesus had done for them. The really interesting thing is, is that I love the fact that the Last Supper isn't the Last Supper in the Bible. In fact, Jesus shows up a whole heap of different places and continues eating with people afterwards. <laughs> How cool is it that the Last Supper wasn't the Last Supper? It's almost like it, he's kind of making a point. It ain't over. It is not over. <laughs> in fact, one of the ways to show the disciples that he, um, one of the ways to show the disciples that he was still real and not a ghost was he ate was we ate with them. And in fact, it's like, uh, from what I could find in my about 20 minutes of research, was actually there's, four, there's at least four times that he, ate, that he ate with the apostles or someone, that he, people that he hung out with after he, after he rose again. And I just wanted to talk about one of them. Because otherwise you guys might go to sleep. So I just wanted you to turn to Luke 24 if you've got your Bibles. Um, if not, um, turn to someone that has a Bible and steal it off them because it's a really powerful book. You should have one. Um, if you don't have a Bible, come and see me afterwards. I've still got some Bibles left over from Friday. I'd love to give you a Bible. It'll be so cool. Okay, so Luke 24. Now this um, passage is called On the Road to Emmaus. And we start in verse 13. Now this is just after... Jesus is risen again. They've gone down to the tomb, and there's no one there. The grave clothes are there, but the stone's been rolled away, and um, the clothes are all folded up because he doesn't need them anymore. And so at this point, this is just a couple of disciples, a couple of guys who, are, who, who walked with Jesus, who followed Jesus. They weren't even very important ones. But that's actually really, that's actually really important to know. Like, they, they're not really mentioned anywhere else. So, and they're walking down the road. Now, I don't know, who's seen The Knight's Tale before? Who's seen The Knight's Tale? At one stage, oh, this is inappropriate for a Sunday morning. At one stage, we meet a character called Chaucer, and he's walking down the road pretty downcast because he, he had a bit of a gambling problem, and as a result of that, he literally lost the shirt off his back. If you haven't seen the movie, I'm not going to suggest that you go and watch it. But I really liked it. <laughs> but yeah, so he literally has nothing. He's just walking down the road. And in my head, this is kind of what these disciples would be like. They're talking about everything that had happened. But Jesus is gone. They've got no proof that he's come back. So how do you think that they'll be walking down the road? They'll be drudging. The slow, weary walk of the hopeless. A drudge. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Pretty interesting you could walk with Jesus and still not recognize him. That's actually pretty cool, because they, they at least knew him. Because they were talking about him, but they... Anyway. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers 
handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. So they'd had reports that Jesus was alive, but were still downcast. He said to them, ho oh, ho, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. They get round a table. When he was at the table with them, he took bread gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and, they, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. So guys, as you take communion today, I've got two real quick thoughts because I wanted to tell you the story that it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. As we take communion this morning, know this, that taking communion isn't only for remembering Jesus, it's also, it also opens us up to recognizing him in our everyday walk. Not only that, it opens us up to recognizing and identifying who we are in Christ because of what he has done for us. So let's reflect on that. Who are you in Christ because what he's done for you? And let's take communion together. Awesome, thank you, Lord. Hey, um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take up our tithes and offerings, which is great. So I'd love to invite up one of our awesome elders. She's um. just see as an eldership team just your generosity 
month after month. And I just want to say on behalf of us all, thank you. Thank you so much for everything that um, your generosity enables us to administer. So thank you. So as I said, man, my kids are growing, but when they were between five and 10, we started talking to them about some life principles. Things like being kind to other people and sharing your toys. And when we started down the pocket money route, as I'm sure many of your parents have done, we started talking about savings principles and also about what it means to tithe. And um, we encourage the boys to save and tie the portion of their pocket money each week. And that, was, that worked really well and they, they kind of got that. However, one day we were in town, um, in Woolworths, so that was a long time ago. The boys were about seven and um, they discovered a new Batman toy that did really nifty things when you pushed a button in its stomach. And they were really keen. And um, Richard particularly liked Batman, and he worked out that next week with his pocket money, the following week he'd have enough to buy the Batman toy. And then his face dropped because he said, oh, but if I tie, they won't have enough. So we discussed his options, and one of the options was don't tie. Because we believe, and it's still of the opinion, Roger and I, that God will still love you, whether you give or not. He's not standing there with a stick with a nail on the end of it to beat you over the head if for any reason you're unable to tithe. And, um, and I think there's people here who think like that this morning, and I just want you to know that God says he loves you. He loves you. In whatever capacity you're able to give, he still loves you and he's not punishing you. So that was one of the options, not tithing. One of the other options was choosing to earn more money through some extra jobs. Um, Nana, my mother, had um, three big things full of teaspoons that were silver and always needed polish, but he wasn't so keen on that idea. The third option was tithe and see what God might do. So about a week later, we were back in Woolworths, and uh, I was across um, the other side of the store when I heard Richard yell out like his hand had been cut off. So I rushed over to hear him saying, Mum, see what God did. See what God did. The Batman was half price. So it meant that he could also buy the accessories with the flinging arm stuff. So there we go. It was cool. And one little boy got the message, choosing the to tithe released God into action. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 6 through to 14 talks about modeling generosity. And it starts off about verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give as you have decided in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The first point is, generosity is a choice and it releases joy. A bit further down the passage, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things and all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. For as it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness shall endure forever. Verse 10, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 10 says that generosity releases God for action. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We are blessed to be a blessing. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanied your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. 
and in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace that God has given you. Generosity changes lives by partnering together. God first modeled generosity to us through John 3.16. John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not die and have everlasting life. Generosity or giving of any kind, not just money, but time, expertise, resources, is a choice. And as I said, God will not love you any less, whatever your level of giving. Generosity releases, releases God to move in our lives and in the lives of others. And as I said, John, generosity creates partnership. Next week is Mission Sunday. And we will hear what your generosity has done as we've partnered with others around the world and in our own community. Your generosity has changed lives in India and Africa, and it's changed lives down here through Dream Delivers, Deliverers. For those who are um, collecting the offering, please um, um, start doing that now. Thank you. Verse 2 of 2 Corinthians says, Paul, uh, Paul speaks of boasting of the generosity of, Corinthians, of the Corinthians to the Macedonians. And as an elder, I want to boast to you about your generosity and say thank you. I mean, you only learn to look at where I'm standing to see what your generosity has done and is continuing to do. And I just want to say thank you for that. Your generosity has also given hope. Um, we couldn't, Ray can't do what he does on Friday nights with Invasion without your generosity and your giving. And we want to say thank you for that as well. We are so grateful to you. And I just want to pray that God would bless you, that you would be blessed to be a blessing, that your every need would meet and be met, and that you would know without a doubt what it is to know God as Jehovah Jireh your provider. Amen. I'd, I'd honor Jackie right now, but that's not her love language. So thank you so much, Jackie. That was awesome. Hey, um, so what we're going to do is just as that happens, well, um, we're just going to do one more, just a quick, um, like a chorus or something like that would be awesome. Um, but um, as I was reflecting this morning, just as we get into this last little bit of worship before we get Tabitha up, which is going to be great, um, there's, a ver there's a verse in Isaiah that starts with, um, which talks about waiting upon the Lord. And as I was reading it this morning, and I didn't read it well enough to memorize it, that's a young person's mistake. Um, God dropped into my spirit, if you're, if, you're, if you're not able to wait upon the Lord, then you're going to be weightless. So if you're not able to wait upon the Lord, you're going to be weightless. So I went, oh God, that's awesome, because like, it'd be nice to be weightless. So I could lose a little bit of weight, and he's like, no, no, I mean weightless, that as you move, there'll be no power behind you. But like, I'm going to wait upon the Lord. <laughs> so as, as you stand up, and as we just step into worship just for a little bit, I encourage you to wait upon the Lord.
should arise, my soul will rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. I will call. darkest places you are there with us. Thank you so much for playing this morning. It was awesome. It's real cool. Hey, um, 
I'm just going to invite Tabitha up, so just as you take your seat, just give her a big hand as she comes up to preach the road this morning. I love this church. You clap before I say anything. That's, <laughs> that is uh, just uh, a real blessing, a real blessing. Um, uh, last month, I had the opportunity through my work to go to an amazing conference on brain learning and development. And uh, I was so happy um, to be there, to just learn more, to help um, my patients, the people I work with. And as I'm sitting in the conference, I'm getting more and more excited because I realize all the wisdom and understanding all the brain research, all the rat research, the cell research, the baby research that they're presenting at the conference, it's all in the scripture for us. And I couldn't help but think of the verse in Deuteronomy, God's just given the instructions to these people that had been living in slavery, and he set them free, and he says the secret things belong to God. But these things are for you and your children forever. To be able to live healthy lives. To be able to live the best kind of life. So today I'm going to be looking at a little bit of what I, um, what sparked in me at this conference about how God wants us to handle stress. And then we'll kind of tie in a little bit about what the stress researchers say, and then um, we'll uh, come back to what God's already showing us to do today. Um, so the first part of the scripture I'd like to look at is from 1 Kings 17. And in 1 Kings 17, we meet Elijah. Now, Elijah lives at a very stressful time completely corrupt government, completely a government that made it impossible to serve God, and they were openly promoting an ungodly agenda. And in this circumstance, we have a man who comes out and says, who comes out with an incredible anointing. He has anointing over the weather. Now, how many farmers in the room? Would you like to be able to get the rain to come when you want it to come? <laughs> how, how many people have ever wanted to plan an outdoor event? And you were like, oh, I want some of that Elijah anointing, you know. It's only going to rain at my word. It would be a good thing to have. It's a powerful mana and a powerful anointing that Elijah walked in. And the point of the drought was to get accountability. And so he said there's going to be a drought. There's nothing, no rain, until I say so. So he walks, and that's exactly what happens. But he doesn't just walk in anointing for weather. He walks in a supernatural provision. And God says, there's going to be a drought, there's, but I'm going to take you to a safe place that no one can find you, and, and there's going to be a brook there. And ravens are going to feed you. Now, I don't know how many of you would feel about that plan for your personal finances. I think being to eat uh, food brought from the, by ravens, breakfast and supper, kind of really interesting. And then later on, the brook dries up. Even men of God with anointing for weather and provision, sometimes their circumstances get a little bit tricky. But God had a plan, and he says, go to Zarephath. And there's a widow there, and she's going to take care of you. Now, if you knew cultural rules, this is what I would say to Elijah. Don't you have a better plan than a widow? Don't you know that widows are the people in our culture that are the most needy? Did I hear you right, God? But he goes to Zarephath, he finds the widow, and sure enough, she's just as needy as he had feared. And in fact, she's collecting sticks for her last, to cook the last meal. 
But Elijah is obedient to the word of the Lord, and he actually prophesies over their last meal that the flour will all run out, and the oil won't run out till the drought breaks. Wow. Just think about building that in your own life, that your own sense of God's provision is so great that you can prophesy over your circumstances. There will be enough. There will be enough because of God's faithfulness. So you're getting the idea that Elijah is really a man of faith and power, aren't you? Well, the best is yet to come. It's time for the big showdown between the prophets of Baal and, the, and God. And he says, we'll set up the ultimate World Cup final. Right? We'll set it up. All right. And guess what? The odds are going to be stacked in your favor. You get to go first. You get to fall first. And you can do whatever you want and take as long as you want. I'm not afraid of you. And I'm not Carmel. Just, it's an amazing scene if you can make it in your mind. Because Mount Carmel means a fruitful place, but it was a place that had been three years of drought. It was a devastated place that actually had more into it, but it was ruined. And so on this mountain, um, the prophets of Baal have their turn. And if you wanna, if you're in sports and you wanna hear some good trash talking for the next time you're on the field, you just listen to Elijah because he is he is like giving them a hard time. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he's inconvenienced. He is really giving them the hard time. And then when he, when it's his turn to sacrifice, he actually douses it with water. And of course we know the story, fire falls from heaven. It's so impressive. Everybody's going, ah, oh, it's really God, you know. We want to follow him. And uh, the prophets of Baal are all killed, all 450 of them. And um, now here's the part you like if you're an intercessor. It's an amazing story. Because even after that great victory, God's proven himself. He's going, there's work still to do. And here's your key as an intercessor. When the victory comes, keep praying. Because he had to, even though he had prophesied it to the end of the drought, he had to pray in the end of the drought. And not, it says, he, he felt the breakthrough and he said to his servant, go look for the cloud. And the servant, seven times, he felt the breakthrough and said to the servant, go look for the cloud. And uh, finally, the cloud came, it poured rain. It's an amazing story of, of intercession. I really encourage you to study it on your own. Another great study in this story is just the meaning of the names throughout it. But I'll let you um, delve into that alone because it's so rich and so good. But this is the part I just wanted you to have a little bit of background on Elijah. This is the part I want to talk about. Because after all this victory, after all this success, the man of God gets one more threat. And Ahab the king says, I've got a contract out on you. This time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. And, and for whatever reason, that was what threw this man of God over the edge. And he started to run. He ran into the desert of Beersheba. And he left his servant and went a little further. And he found a broom tree. And uh, Judy, this is the, oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm reading out of the message. So if you'll join me now in 1 Kings 19. Uh, he's under a broom tree. And he says, enough of this, God. Take my life. I'm ready to join my ancestors in the grave. And exhausted, he fell to sleep. And I think some of us have really gotten to the place where we say, oh, one more thing. How can I carry on? One more thing. Isn't it enough what I've done so far? And you come to the place. Now, if you were a Jewish person and you saw the words lone broom tree, you would know what was going to happen next. So um, you would know immediately something good was about to happen because you would remember the story in Genesis about Hagar, who had done the same thing. She had run all the way to Beersheba. She had found herself in the desert 
despairing of life, ready to die with impossible circumstances for which there was no way out. And God, in his amazing ability, sends an angel to Hagar. So you're reading this, you know, broom tree, desert. I know the plot of this story. Next thing it's going to happen is an angel's going to show up. And sure enough, um, suddenly, an angel shook him awake and said, get up and we'll eat. The good news today, guys, for us as we face stress and unbearable circumstances, and there's always the opportunity for an angel to come. There's always an opportunity for an angel to come. And it comes suddenly, not when we expect it, it, it uh, and, but know this, if you're under stress today, God has angels on assignment, ready to strengthen you when you feel like giving up. Now, I was thinking, as I was reflecting myself um, on stress and how I cope and how I show support to people who are undergoing stress, I realized one of my favorite ways to show people I'm supporting them is baking. And I was feeling a little bit bad because I'm like, oh, they're going to have to go to Weight Watchers and figure out that comfort eating does not solve your problems. But then I read the scripture. <laughs> and, and right here is my favorite coping mechanism. So he, sudden, and he looked around, and to his surprise, by his right hand were a loaf of bread baked on some coals and a jug of water. And he ate the meal and went back to sleep. And so I just want to say, although God can give you many coping mechanisms, baking is right here in the scripture. <laughs> That's what we've got to say. Um, you know, sometimes when we're under stress and we're actually despairing, it's because we've been ignoring our body. And our body actually needs rest, it needs sleep, and it needs food. And um, just it might be just good right now to just take a time and check and say, wow, is there anything about my body that needs attention because God says God gave us gave us his treasures in this body he gave you, he gave you your body and maybe God's just letting you say actually pay attention to your body give it some of the care and nurturing that it needs and what I love about this story what happens next it says that Elijah gets up ate and drank his fill but oh excuse me I missed the verse so he goes back to sleep, and the angel of the Lord comes back and gives him the same meal. And then he gets to go to sleep again. And you know, sometimes I think one of the great things about being a Southlander is we have this can-do spirit, don't we? We have this thing, we're, we know we're top number eight wire, we can fix it. But, and she'll be warned. But sometimes we need a little more rest than just a moment. Sometimes we need an extra day of rest, an extra day of sustenance. And sometimes we need to remember that God wanted us to have one day of rest a week. So whatever that looks like for you and whatever that means, be sure to enter his rest. Now, what I love about God's rest, though, is this is the most amazing thing. It says that in, uh, if we keep looking in the scripture, nourished by that meal, he walked 40 days and 40 nights all the way to the mountain of God. And I just want to assure you, when God gives you rest, when he gives you strength to go in the journey of whatever's causing you stress at the moment, 40 days is a number in the scripture that re represents a complete cycle or a complete season. God is going to give you strength for this whole season till this season is completed and you can find your way to the mountain of God to really connect and get what you need. And um, isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? And what I just think is you go two meals, lasted 40 days, 
That does not make sense, does it? But in God's economy, it makes sense. Is that he will give you the provision you need to get through the, um, the circumstance you're in. Now, I just love, I just love what happens next. And I'm going to read it. Um, that what happens when he gets to Mount Corinth, the mountain of God. He, when he got there, he crawled into a cave and went to sleep. Then the word of, the, of God came to him, saying, So Elijah, what are you doing here? I've been working my heart out, heart out for the God of angel armies, said Elijah. The people of Israel have abandoned your covenant. They've destroyed the places of worship and murdered your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. This is a genuine complaint. <laughs> this is a genuine complaint. And, and sometimes our circumstances don't seem fair either, do they? And they don't seem right. And there's a lot of influ outside influences that you're fighting against. Um, we all know people who've taken on it racism and poverty and these are great societal injustices and sometimes it isn't fair and we need to be able to be free to pour out our heart to God. Find a place. What I love is Elijah knew there was a place to go to meet with God when you were really stuck and he went and pursued that place. And then he was really honest with God about what was bogging him. He didn't hold back. Now it gets even more interesting right here. Because um, he was told, go stand by the mountain at attention before God and God will pass by. That's a very interesting answer to the problems that he raised, isn't it? And then a hurricane wind ripped through the mountain and shattered the rocks before God. But God was not to be found in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But God wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, a gentle and quiet whisper. We'd just like to pause there. You know, if you'd asked... A person in Israel, how does God speak on the mountain of God? They would have said, oh, go back to the, ten, the beginning of the Ten Commandments. There was an earthquake. There was fire. There was wind. That's how God is going to speak. That's when you know God shows up because there's an earthquake, a fire, and a wind. But you know what? God's actually bigger than the way he's moved in your life in the past. Do you know that God has many ways to talk to you that you don't, that you aren't even yet aware because you're still listening for the earthquake, the fire, and the wind? And, and I just want to encourage you today, go find that place in God where you can hear the new way that he's talking to you because he hasn't left you comfortless. And so just what happens next is amazing because they have the same discussion, but this time Elijah can get an, gets an answer that he can live with. God asks him again, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I'm, I'm just sensing right now that God's speaking to people here today saying, what are you doing here? What are you looking for from me? And he wants to dialogue with you about the things in your heart that are bothering you the most. Now what happens after, they, after God reveals that he's going to talk to Elijah differently, Elijah gets this amazing answer to the, all his stress. He says, God says, go back the way you came through the desert to Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel, make him king over Aaron. Then anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, make him king over Israel. And finally, Elisha, son of Jehu, oops, excuse me, Elisha, son of Shaphat, um, will anoint him to succeed you as prophet. And then he says, I've got the social justice thing in hand, 
Anyone who escapes death by Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and anyone who escapes death by this guy will be killed by Elisha. Meanwhile, I'm preserving for myself 7,000 souls, knees that haven't bowed to, bowed to the god ba uh, Baal, the, um, those who haven't kissed his image. And when you listen to God's answer, it's really profound and amazing in that God shows him new options that he hadn't considered before. There's all these people and they're ready to do a job. They're ready to help you and address these concerns. He shows him new leadership. And most of all, he gives him a new connection. Some people believe that Elisha the Tishbite, actually, if you understand the meaning of those words, some people believe it actually means stranger from a strange place. And here he is with that word over his life that he's a stranger. And then he comes to the end of his rope, and he's, he's, now he believes the lie, I'm alone. And I think it was a youth speaker several years ago who said that's the biggest lie that Satan would like us to believe, that we're actually alone. And um, we just, let's just uh, break that lie over our lives. Let's just let, break it over our lives right now. Refuse to partner that you're all alone. And just receive the companionship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to be your companion. So you'll never be alone. And, and God actually wants to speak to you. But he's probably speaking to you in a way you don't recognize. To point out the connections and the companions that he has for you. I just think it's um, amazing how God knows our deepest needs as humans, isn't it? Now, I want to quickly go to Jesus. Now, you could look throughout the life of Jesus and see so many things in the way he handles stress. But we'll go straight to the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's so, it's so appropriate that we have communion today because he had just celebrated the Passover meal and had communion with his disciples. And everybody was in a good mood because Passover is the celebration of freedom. But Jesus knew that everything that had happened in the Passover was about to happen to himself. And he st was starting to feel the weight of it. And so I'm going to switch to the New King James Version and read from Luke 22. And coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was... And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling on the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray. And some of the same themes that we see from the life of Elijah, we're seeing in the life of the Jesus. And he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, a place he was accustomed to going. And we all need places in our life where we're accustomed to hearing from God. And probably the best place, and we'll see this later in science research, is have a, have a regular place where you quiet yourself with God and meet with Him. But I'll tell you, as a young mother, I had to learn more creative places than my quiet time to meet with God. And I found out that God is perfectly capable of speaking to you in the shower. He's perfectly capable of speaking to you on the way to work if you're listening to Him in the car. Um, I had a real challenge. I was used to hearing from God. Uh, I, I would drive to work and I was used to hearing from God at about a certain stoplight because that's how long it took me to calm myself down to hear from God. And then at that stoplight, I would know, okay, God, tell me what's going to happen today. What, are, what do I need to know about you? What's going to happen? And um, then we moved. And I moved a lot closer to work. <laughs> 
and I didn't have as much time to quiet myself down. But you know what I found out? God still met me on, on the way to work in my car, if that's all I could give that day. And we have an amazing, generous God, but we have to get accustomed to meeting with Him. And that's something that we can practice. What's amazing, if you've read the book Outliers, one of the theories in that book is that to become a world expert, you need to spend 10,000 times, 10,000 hours doing that activity. And I would like to suggest to us today, what if we spent 10,000 hours in the presence of God? Could we bring that? Then we would be an expert at becoming aware of what he was doing. Expert at the different ways that he speaks to us. And we could bring the presence of God into any situation. But we've got to practice. Because as humans, we learn things. And we have to, become, we have to enlarge the place of our tent. We have to enlarge our spirit. Hey, what would happen to your cows, Paul, if you could bring the presence of God regularly? I just, we, we have not yet even begun to discover what would happen if we become an expert at meeting with God. Now, the other thing is, Jesus, do you notice in this story that Jesus asked his friends for support? He asked them to pray for him, and he didn't hide his sorrow from them. And I think we can learn from Jesus in this regard. And I've been really challenged lately because um, when Shane Willard was here, he had this great teaching on that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the earth. Have you heard that? Do you remember that he brought that teaching? And I've been mulling that over. And so as I looked at this passage with new eyes, I thought, what if, so Jesus, I've always thought it was sort of like, well, um, I don't want to do this, God, but you're bigger, and so I guess I will. You're bigger, you know better, I guess I will. And what if the dialogue was more like this? <sighs> you know, God, we, Father, we decided on this plan together long ago. We already accomplished it long ago. But now in my humanness, it seems too hard. Do we have any other options, Father God? And you know, when you're in the middle of a circumstance, maybe you need to talk to God about your options. Because even Jesus had a choice here. Isn't that amazing? God is not coercing us or forcing us. He's giving us options and choices. And that's amazing, really. And then part of this scripture that comes back, and it's not clear in the Luke passage, but it's much more clear in Mark, is that Jesus actually said to his friends, you let me down. You were sleeping when I needed you. And that level of honesty is really hard, isn't it? It's really hard. And it just shows me that Jesus... Jesus and his disciples had a lot of trust. And we need to build that trust with other people so we can ask for their support, but we can also give them feedback when we feel let down. And Jesus is so amazing because he always does this with the goal of maintaining and strengthening relationship. Isn't that beautiful? He never tells us something so we'll feel so embarrassed we'll run away and never try again. He always tells us stuff so that we'll say, yes, that your word of correction brought me encouragement. And that can be really um, challenging for some of us because, well, we'll get to it in a few minutes. So how does this relate to the current brain research? Um, so we'll... Sorry, I have to transition from scripture, which I love, and to brain research. The first lecture I heard was the, one of the most famous brain researchers in the world who's been checking stress hormone levels in people's hair. And uh, spit, that's to tell me I'm supposed to be done. Um, <laughs> and she's identified four things that seem to cause the most stress for people. And her little acronym is NUTS. Um, things, what's driving you nuts? Things that are new, novel, that you've never experienced before. We all get a little bit of performance pressure. Things that are unpredictable, that hit us out of the blue, and we, we weren't expecting it. Things that were the threat to the, a threat to the ego, where you feel personally attacked. 
and things where you have no sense of control about. These are the things that they've shown through countless research creates the highest level of stress, creates the physical symptoms we get of increased heart rate, stomach ache and churning, headaches and muscle aches from the tension in our muscles, difficulty concentrating and difficulty sleeping. And um, when the stress, stress for a while is good, it helps us perform, it helps us function, it helps us survive. Um, but stress over a long time actually hurts our system in that our regulation systems become deregulated. And so much so that the, each cell in its gene structure can actually be creating that the actual cell expression changes. And they can map these on our genes. People under stress um, show different gene expression. So what does brain research say that we should do about our stress? Number one is learn to regulate yourself by breathing. And I was so excited when I heard this because what did what was God's revelation to Moses? What's my name, Moses? When you say my name, what is it going to be? Yud HaVaha. Yud HaVaha. That rabbis taught that the name of God sounded like breathing. And when Jesus, uh, Shane Willard, taught us one translation of the Lord's Prayer is, God, who's as close as the air I breathe. And I think Andrew Stone told the youth, every breath you take, you're breathing in God, you're getting stronger than your enemy because every breath you take, you breathe, breathe in God. And if that wasn't enough, even from the beginning of creation, the ruach, there was chaos in the, uh, all around, and the ruach, the breath of God, moved over the waters, bringing creativity to chaos. And so every time we breathe, God is sharing a divine hongi with us. We're sharing his breath. We're receiving fellowship. And even now, if you, God wants us to become aware of his name, and he might be highlighting one of his names, one of his attributes for you. And breathing itself regulates our body. The other thing is that God wants to give us perspective. One of the big things we can do when we're out of control or we have a threat is actually say, what is it about this that scares us? And just as the Packers taught us earlier this year, God wants to lead us to the rock that's higher than I. Or as we sang in the song, we need to keep our eyes above the waves. And this is when we can quiet ourselves in his presence. He can give us the perspective we need. How many times have you gone up in a plane and, and gone, which one's my house? It's so tiny. But when you go to clean it, that house seems, seems big, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially if you're a, a mess piler upper like I am. And uh, we need, the scripture is so amazing. Uh, I just appreciate our home group. Somebody gave me a word this week. Be, as they prayed for me, they said, God wants to tell you, be still and know that he is God. And I was so encouraged for two reasons. One, it just spoke to my circumstance. And two, I was like, this person didn't go to the Brains Research Conference with me. He didn't know that the message of the Brain Research Conference was quiet yourselves, be still, get perspective. And um, it's just amazing how that truth is hidden for us. Lately, um, you know, the scripture says, there remains a rest for the people of God. Make every effort to enter that rest. And lately I've been realizing Jesus paid a high price for my peace. And I can choose whether I enter into that peace that he paid such a high price for. Or I can, I can choose whether I'm going to allow my mind to develop a pattern of worry and rumination. And we, the scripture makes it clear we need to fight for the things that, and the, that Jesus has paid for, especially when it comes to our mind. Because he has, we, we learn patterns, and he wants to give us a new and renewed mind. But we have to practice that renewed mind. 
Now the third thing I want to bring up is that the power of attachment is so powerful that human beings don't become whole human beings without a nurturing um, parent or caretaker. Um, and if you have a child and you're loving on that child, particularly in the first baby years, you are securing the future of civilization. You should know that. We have a Trinitarian God who's in fellowship with himself all the time. And God wants us to be attached and connected to other people. And that takes an investment of time. And it takes an investment of risking hurt. And recently I've become convicted. You can tell I'm a people person. I love people. But my family will tell you when there's conflict, I withdraw. And I step away from my attachment that actually are supposed to be giving me the strength and resilience to get through my stress. And God's just recently showing me that um, I need to have better skills so I can stay attached to the people I care about no matter what the conflict or stress. And I know God's speaking to people today. So I'd like to just ask the music team to come up. And Peter, would, could we sing that awesome song that you, the, the last one you just finished with? that actually contains everything I've just spoken about today. And I'm just, if you'd like to do this now, it's fine. Otherwise, just take notes and do it later. But maybe you could just start breathing and becoming aware of God's presence, filling you. Maybe you want to even bring the stressful situation that you're in to mind. And just keep breathing. Become aware of God, His name, and who He is. And then maybe you would like to ask for God's perspective, saying, this stress seems too much for me. What's your opinion, Father God? What would you like me to know about the stress that I'm facing? And then maybe you could take a moment to be thankful for the people in your life that God's given to you that are safe, and that you're attached to. Maybe you want to be thankful for a praying relative who prayed you into the kingdom. Maybe you want to be thankful for the person who's stuck by you when you've been your worst. Maybe you want to be thankful um, for your mom. Maybe you need to ask God to give you the strength to reconnect with some people that you've pushed away. just going to sing this song as an act of faith and declaration that God is aware of our stress and his elements.
What an awesome word today, eh? It's so amazing. So my, my prayer, my encouragement for you is to go out today. Just know that um, you may be a little nuts. But actually there's rest to be found in the Lord. They were so helpful to have this. Sometimes it's so helpful to have structure and things to hang off. You know, I've got a greater understanding, which is amazing. It's, it's, it's just so good. That's officially the end of our service. If you need prayer today, don't don't leave without without feeling lighter, feeling free. Go and take someone out for coffee. There's a cafe downstairs. But if you need a Bible, if you want to talk to us about how you can meet Jesus, just come and see us down on the front row. There's a ministry team here that would love to pray for you. But apart from that, we'll see you tonight. If you're a lady, remember evolution is coming up and it's coming up fast, two weeks now. So I encourage you to find out about it if you don't know about it already. Have a great week.